Okay. So, so now we have all the ingredients we need to construct our holographic model. No? We have uh, the uh, part corresponding to the jam mills theory that we can, where we can describe confinement and deconfinement. And we know how to add uh, flavors to this and describe their dynamics. So now we want to have a, a state with a finite uh, baryon density. Uh, so before I did uh, some kind of uh, plot of the interior of the neutron star, no, so I said that there are several layers here, the crust and the core that is divided in outer and inner core. So in principle, the part that corresponds to the crust and the outer core is, uh, can be described uh, using uh, nuclear matter models. And we are interested in the dynamics uh, or the equation of a state of matter in the inner core. Okay, this is where we don't have any first principle method to describe this uh, kind of matter. Okay, so in principle, this matter can be in a state uh, which is uh, deconfined, so it could be just some kind of quark matter. Or it could still be confined and be some kind of uh, nuclear baryonic matter. Okay. So in principle, uh, we would like to have a holographic model that can describe both types of matter. But uh, as we will see, this is much harder to describe. So I'm going to start by assuming that there can be a phase transition to quark matter. And then uh, we can use the holographic model to describe this quark matter. OK, so uh, we are going to assume that there can be quark matter. at the core. OK, so we want to be in a deconfined phase. So that means the dual is going to be some kind of black brain. And then, uh, in order to have a finite variant density, this means that we need that the time component of the variant current is different than zero. Then applying the holographic dictionary, this means that uh, the time component of the dual gauge field will have a non-trivial profile. So this will be what we need to introduce in this uh, setup. OK, so as a proof of principle, we can start with the D3, D7 model, which is simpler. Okay, so I just wrote uh, for you the metric. So this will be the ADS5 crosses 5 metric in the black hole phase. And then uh, what we can do now is uh, take the zero temperature limit, OK? And 
neglect uh, the part of the geometry close to the horizon. So for neutron stars, this is a good approximation. Okay, the, the densities here are of the order of the lambda QCD scale, hundreds MeV, and the temperature is like kilo electron volts. So the temperature is negligible. So we're going to assume that the temperature is so small that we can neglect the horizon part, okay? Uh, for, yes? So when you're talking about the temperature associated to neutron star, it's different from black hole Hawking temperature, right? Because there are no horizons. So this is just some, what is the temperature you're talking about? Yeah, but the Hawking temperature is the temperature of the dual field theory. Yeah. So it will be the temperature of the matter inside the core. So I'm going to assume that I can take this temperature inside the core to be so small that it's negligible. So, but then you are saying somehow that the the uh, the temp the heat kind of temperature there is dual to the Hawking temperature in this black brain picture. Yeah, that's the usual okay, dictionary. Okay. I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this simplifies. Nice yes. So uh, when you take the temperature to zero, are you in a deconfined phase in that sense? Uh, well, you are in a phase where the adjoint uh, degrees of freedom uh, behave like they were in a deconfined phase in the sense that there are no, the spectrum is not gap. Okay, so it's really a Coulomb phase, no? But uh, so there is no screening. But the glue, so for the, to describe the matter inside the core, the part corresponding to the glue is not so important. What matters is the work matters. Yeah, okay. no. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so doing this uh, simplifies a lot the problem. Uh, so now we're going to consider the D7 embedding. Y of R, as before, and we are going to turn on the E1 gauge field on the D7. And the time component with it. Okay, so in the limit when R goes to infinity, the asymptotic value of this is equal to the baryon chemical, well, to the quark chemical potential, to be precise. No? Following the usual dictionary no? that relates the source to the uh, asymptotic value. So I can take the DBI, so the induced metric is the one I wrote before when we have uh, this factor equals to one. And now, uh, because we have this gates field, the DBI action uh, becomes a, bit, a little bit more complicated, but it's easy to evaluate as well. So there is some um, overall factor. And then, If you compute the determinant that appears in the DBI action, then you find something like this. Okay, so before turning on the gates field, it was just uh, this part, right? And now with the gates field turned on, you get a contribution like this, okay? Now, this uh, constant is just depending on the uh, overall factors that appear in front of the action, uh, and then, well, there is a factor of uh, L to the eight also, so that gives something that you can write in terms of field theory quantities. After some rescaling. 
Okay, so now uh, we're going to find the, the new embeddings when we turn on this thing. So this is an electric uh, flux on the D7 membrane, right? We are turning on, or we are trying to turn on an electric flux. So these are cyclic uh, variables in here, so we can just write the equations as of motion as having the conjugate momentum equal to a constant. Here, okay. Where, yeah, LD7 is uh, all this here. So this gives, this is, this gives uh, this equation divided by. This one gives this. I guess I'm following the same steps as before, just uh, with the new ingredient of having the gates fill. Turn on. Yeah, they are just uh, constants. These are dimensionful constants. Okay, so, well, here you can just do some algebraic square this and then do algebraic manipulations to solve for y prime and a t prime. So you find that you can simplify these equations to this form. So this will be, you can essentially separate the equations for y and a, T. And you find this thing. Okay, so if, uh, if D is equal to zero, then that goes back to the case we saw before without any density, no? So the gauge field just becomes uh, constant or zero. And here we have something of this form. So comparing to the solution we found before, this is what we call before R0 to the cube, right? So in the supersymmetric case, uh, if D is zero, C is zero. For the reason that I explained before, no? that we will have a D7 and an anti-D7 at the boundary. Okay, now if D is different than zero, then there are two cases. If D is smaller than C, then this will be negative, and then it will be similar to this case where R0 is different than zero. So that corresponds to a non-supersymmetric case. So if we want to have a configuration with finite uh, density and supersymmetric, I mean the density breaks supersymmetry, but there are no anti-D7 brains at the boundary, then we need, uh, well, this is absolute, that the absolute value of D is larger than C. 
Okay, and in this case, this is positive, so the brain, well, here, doesn't have to go back to the boundary. It just continues towards the interior. Any questions about this? Okay. So, short, short question. Yeah. Uh, last week, this comment came up. So, mm. in the case d equals zero, a possibility is at constant, right? Yes. Which is not the same as at zero, right? Is, is, is from uh, this perspective, is there any difference or important difference? The difference is that if at is non-zero, the chemical potential is non-zero. So, if you want to. When we compare solutions with D different than zero, with solutions with D equals to zero, we have to put the same chemical potential. No? So, but for the configurations with D equals to zero, it's just trivial because you just make AT to take any constant value. Okay, so. So the solutions uh, will be of the form some integration constant minus the integral of what I wrote there. Uh, remember that the quark mass, no, I, I, I'm taking this uh, integral in such a way that when r goes to infinity, the integral is zero, and we are left with y not. So the quark mass is just this constant. Okay, now we need to decide uh, uh, what are the boundary conditions for this embedding in the infrared. So the value, no, if we use this plot that we had before, this will be why not. So when D was zero, C had to be zero, and we just had a, the straight uh, embedding. Now, for D non-zero, we can have that C is non-zero, and then the embedding will bend. And then if uh, it could end somewhere here, above uh, this, the origin, or it could just go all the way to the origin. Now, I, remem I remind you that this is where the D3 brains are, so this is the Poincaré horizon. So if we had an embedding like this one, then uh, we will have, because AT prime is non-zero, there is some electric flux going on the world volume of the D-brain. But there are no charge fields on the D-brain, so we need to put some source for the electric field here. That will mean adding some strings here. Okay? So we'll have to put some strings that source the electric field on this brain. Okay? And these strings will pull down the embedding. So in fact, the equilibrium configuration is just that the embedding goes all the way to the Poincaré horizon, and all the charges are at this horizon. Okay, so the electric flux is coming from the horizon. So we impose the condition that I at r equals to zero is zero, and that fixes this uh, why not in terms of an integral. So we have to do this integral. And this can be done, well, working with some book or in Mathematica. And it takes this form. So this gamma is just a numerical constant, which is, happens to be this. So it's around 
Okay, so, so we have fixed uh, this parameter instead of C and D. Okay, now we go to the gates field. So the solution for the gates field uh, is very similar to the solution for the embedding, just changing some terms and some factors. So 80 will be the chemical potential, minus 1 over 2 pi alpha prime. Plus this integral. No? So, so again, I fix uh, this uh, integral in such a way that when R goes to infinity, it equals to the chemical potential. Now, about the boundary condition for the gauge field in the infrared, uh, we can imagine now that uh, the temperature is very small but not completely zero. So there will be here a small black hole horizon. And then I think you saw with Aristos that uh, you need to impose that the gauge field uh, vanishes at the horizon, right? In order for the solution to be regular. So when you take the radius of the horizon to zero, then you keep this boundary condition for the gauge field. So you need to impose that AT at R equals to zero is zero for regularity. And then this fixes the chemical potential in terms of these parameters. No? We have to do the same integral with changing C by D. So this will be gamma over 2 pi alpha pi. OK, so now everything is fixed in terms of two parameters, D and C. And, but we actually want to uh, write everything in terms of the core mass and the chemical potential. No, but it's just, that just means solving for this uh, D and C in terms of MQ and mu. So, well, if you make, uh, I can do this here. It's so simple that one can do it even explicitly. You just take first the ratio of mu and m. And that's just the ratio of d and c. OK. And now, uh, yeah. OK. So it, I want to write the a variant density in terms of uh, these quantities. Okay, so the variant density is related to this uh, object, the canonical momentum. And it is given by the using the holographic dictionary as the limit when R goes to infinity of this canonical momentum divided by some factor. Um, yeah, I think I had this L8 before, so let's just keep it like this. Okay, um, so now I can divide the variant density by the mass to the cube. And that's going to give me uh, a factor like this, and then d squared minus c squared. OK, so. So the D is coming from this definition, and then the mass uh, 2 pi alpha prime is y not. Y not is proportional to this. So when I invert and uh, take the cube, then this becomes this D 
square minus c square factor divided by c cube divided by gamma cube. Okay, so, so that gives uh, this overall factor and then the extra two pi alpha prime factors. Uh, okay, so now we can. Ah, sorry, here there should be. Yes, there was an error to write. Sorry. Okay, so now this becomes something like 2 pi to the 4, this constant, lambda jam mills square, gamma cube. And then here I have uh, something like d over c uh, square minus 1 times d over c, reorganizing these factors. So this is the cube part, and this is d over c. So once I wrote it in this way, I can use uh, this. So this becomes, uh, so this factor, one can work it out. So it becomes this thing here. And then you have mu over m q square minus 1 mu over m q. Okay, so the density, sorry, this was not the variant density, but the quark density. Uh, the quark density, well, no, it's varying because it has to be multiplied. So the variant density is this thing. Uh, NF and C over lambda jam mills, gamma cube, mu, mu squared minus n q squared. Okay? So we got the baryon density as a function of chemical potential and quark mass. Okay, so with the happens that when mu and mq you can tune them to make zero baryon density. Why why is that? So when when mu is mq Yes, so when mu is mq, that's like making d equals to c. d equals to c. Okay, and that, uh, yeah. Well, so physically, no, if uh, you have a, a charged particle of mass m, uh, you need uh, to introduce an energy in the system which is at least equal to this mass. So you need the chemical potential to be at least equal to mq. Right? Otherwise, you cannot produce these particles. Yeah. So that's the reason. Yeah. Okay, so now from here, we can use that the density is the derivative of the pressure with respect to the chemical potential, right? And then we just integrate, and we find that the pressure should be the integral of this thing. So we have the overall factor, and then we have mu to the 4 divided by 4 minus mq squared mu squared over 2, plus some constant that doesn't depend on the chemical potential. Right? And then in order to fix this constant, uh, well, as Carlos was saying, when mu equals mq, there is no density. So that should correspond to the case uh, where there is no electric flux on the brain. So that will correspond to the embedding where the brain is just uh, straight. So if you compute uh, the action of this brain, it's supersymmetric, so the action vanishes. So this means that the pressure should satisfy that when mu equals mq, 
this will be zero, right? Because otherwise uh, there could be a discontinuity in the free energy and that's not uh, physically sensible. So that fix is completely this constant and then you find the final result for this uh, pressure, which is uh, some constant like this. And this F0 constant is uh, NFNC over 4. OK, so, so we've got the pressure, which is minus the free energy. No? So we have all the information about the thermodynamics of this system. OK, so we are, we are almost done. We just need uh, to compute the energy density and write the pressure in terms of the energy density or vice versa, no? to have the equation of a state. So for this, we just use thermodynamic relations. We make uh, that the energy density is equal to mu times the density minus the pressure. Okay, so the density we had there, the pressure we have here, then the result is, uh, this is equal this quantity here, which is three times the pressure, plus four times F naught nq square, mu square minus nq square. Okay. So this is just sim some simple algebra. Okay. So. Well, now, in order to write uh, the energy density in terms of the pressure, we can just uh, use this relation to, find, to write this difference, mu squared minus m squared, in terms of p over f naught. No? You see that this difference appears in both terms. So that gives uh, an equation of a state. Uh, of this form. So The energy density is three times the pressure. And then uh, we have an extra term, which is four times F naught, M Q square, the square root of P over F naught. So, so this is what we needed to, to be able to uh, solve the T of E equations. No? So this will describe the matter inside the core in the star. OK, so a couple of comments about this. If MQ is equal to 0, then the energy density is just 3 times the pressure, which is the conformal equation of a state. So this is what we expected from before, because uh, when the mass is zero and we have this uh, massless embedding, the induced metric on the d brain was ABS5. So that means it was still a conformal theory with flavors. So then you expect this kind of equation of a state. Yeah, that's right. That was the brain with I not equal to zero. Now, we can look at the uh, stiffness in the general case. So from here, it's easier to compute the derivative of the energy density with respect to the pressure. 
So that's just three times plus two times mq square um, a square root of f naught over p. And then we invert it. And then we find this quantity. So what we observe is that this is a positive quantity. So this means that the denominator is always larger than 3. So this is always smaller than the value in the conformal theory, unless the mass is 0. So this means that this equation of a state is uh, what we will call a soft equation of a state. So this will have consequences for the modeling of the star. Okay. Uh, because the matter is more easily compressed. So it's soft. Yeah. Okay, so now let's see what happens when we try to apply this to the neutron stars. Okay, so we are going to First of all, we are going to consider uh, some hybrid uh, equation of a state where at low densities we just have ordinary nuclear matter equations of a state. Okay, so for densities below the saturation density, these are the ones you compute using effective theories or fit to experiments. And if the density goes above that, there are some extrapolations that people use using phenomenological models. And that there are standards of, there is a whole family of these models. Some of them are softer, some of them are stiffer. So one can consider several of them and construct hybrid equations of a state with those. Then at high densities, we will have uh, the holographic quark matter. Okay. Now, we need the uh, in order to use these two things together, we need to fix the parameters in the holographic model in some way. So we extrapolate uh, the holographic model. And then we set, for instance, nf equals nc equals 3, like in QCD. And so we are already extrapolating for the larger limit. We take uh, uh, an approximation for, so the simplest thing is to use symmetric matter as an approximation. So that means that all the quark masses are set to the same value. Equals MQ. And then as we saw, then the conditions of charge neutrality and beta equilibrium are satisfied by setting all the chemical potentials the same for the quarks. And the electro electron chemical potential to zero. So this simplifies the problem in another aspect, which is if this was non-zero, I will have to consider electrons as well. So my equation of state will have the contribution from the holographic part plus the contribution from the electrons. Okay? Typically, the electrons will not be a very strong contribution, but they may affect how the chemical potential is changing in the radial direction. 
so this is the simplest uh, scenario. You can generalize this by considering different quark masses. And that is actually relevant for uh, some uh, questions related to rotating neutron stars. But uh, let's keep it uh, simple. Okay, so we still have one more parameter, which is the top coupling of the dual field theory. So a way to fix this is, uh, for instance, to match with the perturbative result. So we know that uh, for QCD, when mu goes to infinity, we have uh, free quarks. Hey, Carlos, yeah. maybe it was not clear when you said it, because the question is that yeah. if you take an F equals NC, yeah. is it OK to work in the pro approximation? So it's the extrapolation thing maybe is not clear. Right, so I work in the holographic model in the probe approximation, but then I'm extrapolating to these values. Right. So it's not a control approximation, but that it's just, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, it's okay. Okay, so this is uh, free quarks. And then uh, the pressure of the free quarks, the Stefan Boltzmann value, will be an F and C over 12 pi square mu to the 4. Okay. So if we compare with the mu going to infinity limit of uh, this expression, that fixes the value of F0, and that fixes the value of the top coupling. So we match by setting lambda jam mills to 3 pi squared over gamma cube, which is 10.74, OK? So it's relatively strong, but it's not asymptotically large, right? So this is another extrapolation for the model. At least it's still strongly coupled with this. And finally, uh, we have to decide what this mass is. OK, so in the holographic model, I told you that uh, the mass in the zero temperature case is just the given by the energy of a stream between the D3 and the D7. OK? So a way to think of this is that uh, when you introduce a physical quark in the system, it costs you uh, this energy to have it, right? And in QCD, when you have chiral symmetry breaking, uh, what happens is that uh, the effective mass of the quarks that compose the variance and the mesons is different from the bare quark or the or the current quark. So the masses that you see in the list of the standard model, which are a few MeV, uh, are much smaller than the effective mass they have in QCD. So those masses are the constituent quark masses. And it's roughly speaking the cost of in energy of introducing the quark. So we identify this with the constituent quark mass. And that's around the mass of the baryon divided by 3, which is 300 and something MeV. OK. OK, so this completely fixes everything. And now if you have a plot of the equation of a state, well, let's make the pressure versus the chemical potential first. Then you have that. Uh, there are some equations of state from the nuclear matter models that look like this. OK, so typically, this is a stiff and this is soft. And then the equation of the holographic model, the equation of state looks something like this. Okay. So at the beginning, it's below 
the nuclear matter models, but then it grows faster. And then it intersects at some point with these guys. So there will be a transition at the points where this uh, intersect. So the dominant phase is always the one with larger pressure because that's uh, a smaller free energy. So at the beginning we have nuclear matter and then there is a phase transition and then we have core matter. And the point where the transition happens depends on the nuclear matter equation of a state that we are taking. In terms of the pressure versus energy density, Uh, this looks a little bit like this. So there is some um, part that was coming from Carroll effective theory. So these are the nuclear matter equations of a state. And then there is perturbative QCD somewhere here. And then you have something like the holographic equation of a state going in this way. Uh, so the point where the phase transition happens is uh, where uh, uh, so here it will happen somewhere here, I think. And then this will happen at higher values. And this will happen still at higher values. Okay, so it happens at some pressures. And then we go from the nuclear matter equation of a state to the quark matter holographic equation of a state. There is a jump in the energy density. It's a first order phase transition. And the size of this jump is the latent heat of the transition. Okay, so the latent heat and the point of the transition depends on the equation of the state that you take. And typically, it's quite large for this model. Okay, so, so this will be the equation of the state that uh, we are using, or the equations of the state that we are using. Question. Yeah. So, what's the physics behind the fact that this plot goes to the perturbative QCD for very, very large energies? Why? Why is that? Why is that happening? Why the pressure? This one. Uh, yeah, yeah. Why the pressure for very, very large energies goes to the? Yes. So, I, at very large energies, QCD becomes weakly coupled and asymptotically free. So, the pressure becomes the one for free quarks. And I'm fitting the parameters of the holographic model, so it goes to the same value. No. So yeah, I'm not trying to fit the effective theory because yeah, the physics in the infrared is completely different uh, for this model. Okay, so now with this uh, equation of states, uh, no, for instance. We could take the equation of a state to be this curve, then there is a jump here, and then there is the holographic one, or this one jump, so forth. We can plug this in the T of E equation and find the mass versus radius curves. Right? What we are doing is uh, we can change the chemical potential in the at the center of the star. That's equivalent to uh, changing the pressure, the central pressure, and then we, as we increase the chemical potential, then we will be moving along one of these branches until we reach the holographic one. Okay? And that gives a curve in the mass radius plane. So it r looks roughly speaking like this. Uh, like one solar masses, two solar masses. And then this is about 10 kilometers, 10, 14. So, okay, so if we have a soft equation of a state, then 
is doing something like this, then if we have a stiffer equation of state, is something doing something like this, and if we have a even more stiff equation of state, is doing something like this, and this part is where you start having uh, quark matter at the core. Okay, so this is uh, so this is the stiff. This is the soft, and this part is just nuclear matter. And then there is, uh, here, you start having uh, the quark matter at the core. OK, so you see that there is a kink, a very sharp change in the behavior of the curve. And well, what happens because of this change in behavior, when this starts going down, when you increase the pressure, then this means that these stars are actually unstable against uh, gravitational collapse. So one finds that uh, uh, the first order phase transition makes the star unstable. So Okay, this is uh, consistent with the fact that we found that the equation of state is soft for the quark matter. No? So, in order to support uh, the star, you need a stiff equation of state. So then, uh, this is stiffer than the quark matter, and then suddenly you have this phase transition to softer matter, so it's not able to support the star. Okay, so. So the lesson one can extract from that is that uh, there is no quark matter at the core, but it is still consistent with these observations of uh, two solar masses for some equations of state. You know, so what this is doing is uh, cutting the nuclear matter part before, and then it's ruling out some equations of state that are too soft to reach the two solar mass uh, bound. Okay. Uh, questions? Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. The question is, how can you tell which one is the stiffer one? And uh, well, is the one that can support uh, larger masses, essentially. But, yeah. Also, you see that uh, yeah, the matter is less compressed, right? Because the radius is typically larger. So it's uh, able to support more of the star. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, could you comment? It seems that this is a multi-valued function. Like for the same radius, you could have two values of m by m naught. So it's like same size neutron star could have two different masses, two or three or whatever? Uh, mm. Yeah, I'm not sure if I plot this correctly. Okay, okay. But, uh, I see. Okay. Yeah. It single value? Uh, what is single value is uh, the Amer for a mass and radius. If you give the mass and radius and you don't fall, and you fall here, then this equation of state is not right. right. But it might happen that you have uh, the same radius and different masses, I think. But, uh, oh, could you repeat? Sorry, I lost. Yeah, this could be true, that you can have uh, different masses for the same radius. Okay. Or different, or for a given mass to different radii. I see, OK. Yeah. More questions? Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, how do you apply the phase transition from quark matter equation of state to nuclear matter equation of state in TOV equations? Do you change the equation of states by hands at the phase transition pressure? Yes, yeah, so there are several ways to do it. The simplest one is uh, you assume that there is a fast transition, and then you just uh, make uh, this jump in the density and the energy density. So the pressure is always continuous, right? But uh, when you move in the radial directions, there will be suddenly a jump in these other quantities of the first order phase transition. Another way to do this, which is more elaborate, is uh, you can take into account that there can be uh, something like a um, uh, phase separation, right? So you could have the phase transition not happening suddenly, but you start forming bubbles inside the start of the other phase. Okay, you have to take, then you have to know also uh, the tension of the bubble, the wall tension to do this. So you can have some mixed phase as well. So people consider both cases. Typically, if you consider a mixed phase, that allows uh, softer equations of a state because you still have the steep phase uh, a little bit more you know, during the transition. So, so here I was just using the simplest case where the phase transition is just fast. No? Okay. So there are other models that uh, also have uh, this deconfined phase. Uh, that people have used to model neutron stars. One is the Witt and Sakai Sugimoto model. Okay, so it works in a similar way with the D8 brains and anti D8 brains. Uh, in this case, uh, well, uh, something similar. The equation of a state is kind of soft. And you need to add uh, some extra ingredients because um, if you in this model there are no masses for the quarks in principle, so you need to add uh, some extra things to add this mass. And then there is also the big Veneziano QCD model, which is a bottom map. So I didn't discuss this model in detail, but it looks like uh, if you take the Witten Sakai Sujimoto model and reduce it to five dimensions. Okay, so you have a part which is the gravitational part, and then another part which is uh, the flavor part that looks like a DBI action. And this also has a deconfined phase which is uh, soft. So in all of these cases, uh, if you have a phase transition to quark matter, the same thing will happen as in the D3D7 model. And then there is uh, a deformation of D3D7, uh, which is also kind of bottom up because it's not, uh, you are changing the D brain action, where uh, essentially you give uh, some additional potential to the embedding function, and that makes the equation of a state uh, more rigid. So in this case, you can support. work matter in this case. So that what it's doing is uh, introducing some anomalous dimension for the for the for the quark uh, bilinear for the chiral condensing. Okay, so people has played the, with this quark matter phase but only in this kind of bottom-up scenario, it has been found that you could have quark matter without uh, the star becoming unstable. Okay, so if we want to have a, a, a more realistic uh, description. We would like to also describe part of the nuclear matter phase uh, using holography. So let's talk a little bit about uh, 
con la graphic nuclear matter. Now, in this case, uh, the picture is going to be that, uh, again, you're going to have here in the outside layers of the star ordinary nuclear matter. And then when you go to the core, then you can have nuclear or quark. holographic matter. So it's going to be also a hybrid equation of a state, like uh, the one I had there, except uh, one has the possibility of uh, having some part of the nuclear matter described by the holographic model. And then the phase transition is described completely within the holographic model. Okay, well, I should mention also that uh, there are also some works that try to describe all the matter in the star using holographic models, okay? But maybe that might be too ambitious because, well, we know f quite well like the outer layers at least. Okay, so what will be a baryon, right? That's what we want to have in this, uh, in the confined phase. So in QCD, a variant is just uh, made out of three quarks in some antisymmetric in color combination. And then when we go to S, U, and C, that's where we're having the holographic models. Then the variant, the natural definition of the variant in this large limit is also an anti-symmetric combination of quarks in color, but now there will be NC quarks. Okay, so this means that uh, the conformal dimension of this uh, object is, to be, is going to be proportional to the number of colors, so it's actually extremely large. So when we want, when we try to do the holographic duality uh, in the larger limit, what happens is that uh, we have these uh, single trace operators, which have a order one number of fields, and they are dual to fields in the gravity theory. Okay. And they have dimensions in units of the radius of anti dissipator, which are of order one as well. Now we have a an object here which will have a mass which is of order n c, so it's not captured by gravity. Okay. Instead, it's captured by some large object, uh, heavy object in the gravity dual. So that typically is uh, some kind of wrapped brain. Okay, so the first. Uh, case that was uh, discussed is if you have n equals 4 super jump mills, it is 5 crosses 5. Okay, so you can introduce a d5 that extended in the time directions and in the 5 sphere, so it's wrapping the 5 sphere. And just have one extra direction, the time direction. So inside this, the action of the D5 brain, there is the west zoom part, which contains a term which is proportional to uh, the integral of the uh, four form, which F. No? So this is the Ramon Ramon potential in, in the background, and this is the gauge field on the, D5, on the D5. So 
And this volume is the time times ORT times S5. So let's integrate this by parts, and they will, then we will have the integral of F5 cross wedge A. So th there is a non-zero flux on the 5 sphere, so this is goes like NC, which is the integral of the 5 on the S5. And then the integral of the time component of the gauge potential. OK, so this means, no? If you look at this, this is uh, the action you will have if you introduce charged particles. No? The charged particle couples to the gauge potential in this way. So this means that you have uh, NC charges on the work volume of the D5. But the D5 is wrapping a compact space. So in order for this to be consistent, you need to uh, make this flux on the D5 go somewhere else or compensate it by, by introducing additional charges. So the way to do this is to add uh, NC strings attached to the D5 brain. So the uh, so we need to attach NC strings, and then we can make them end at the boundaries. So this, if this is the radial direction, then we have the D5 somewhere here, and then we have the NC strings ending on the D5, and they can go to the boundary. OK, so this looks like a baryon. It's called the baryon vertex. OK, so in principle, we could add baryons to the D3, D7 system just by introducing these wrapped D5 brains. But what happens is uh, no, if we have, a, let's say, the D7 brain uh, with some mass, so it will just go up to some value of this radial coordinate. And we introduce the, this varium vertex here, so the strings end on the D7. Then this is going to pull the brain down. So eventually you are going to have just the configurations we considered before, where the electric flux is coming out from the Poincaré horizon. Okay, so this, this is not going to give you really confined nuclear matter or Baryons. Uh, can, can I ask something? So, okay. is there a calculation we can do to see the the D seven being pulled down in that case? Yeah, you have to consider uh, not the. You have to compare the energy of these guys, um, and this also is an object which is feeling the gravitational attraction down. So you have to see if. Uh, there is a net force pulling this down. Mm -hmm. no? uh, and then, OK, that will just give you NC strings attached to the D7. But having NC strings, if you consider the back reaction on the D7 brain, that will give you a change in the medium. But this is more or less heuristic. But, uh, but so the, this D5 is not supersymmetric. This is a D5. This is the baryon vertex, right? The usual yeah. baryon it's not SUSI. It's being attracted by the by the background. So the Vesumino doesn't so. cancel the the Borninfeld in that case. No, because there is no flux. Uh, there is no C7. There is no C There is no flux for the D5 in the background. But this bit, this is a Vesumino of that D5, right? The, this this yeah, thing so that this, you wrote there? Yeah. This in principle, no, you, if you turn on the background gates, right. the background electric right, right. field, that will give the okay, force yeah, yeah, like, okay. like this, no? okay. I think. All right. But All right. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay, maybe, I don't know, you can 
make this stable, but I think not. So we can go to the within Sakai Sujimoto model, and there things are better. So there uh, you have also a wrap brain, which is, in this case, the compact space is a four sphere, so the wrap brain is a different brain. And the different brain uh, can actually uh, be dissolved inside the flavor brains. Okay, so let's consider that. So first, uh, you have uh, the with the Sakai Sukemoto model. Then we have that the action of the D4 has a contribution which is like C3 with F on T on RT times S4. Right? And this again, this gives something like the integral. Well, I'm not putting factors here. The integral of the four flux on the S4 times the integral of DT AT. Okay, so this you see that the default brain is uh, acting as a variant vertex in this uh, geometry. Yeah? Now, if we consider the D8 brain, then inside the action of the D8 brain, there is a West Suminoter, which is like a five form potential, which F, which F. Okay. So this uh, this is the potential that couples to the D4 brain. Uh, so we want to have uh, this in the time and S4 directions that will correspond to the wrap uh, D4 brain. In order for that to do that, we need that this is non-zero in the other direction, so the x, i, u directions. Okay, so we have that the there is a non-zero value for the integral of on this x, i, u directions of the trace of f with f, then the action for the d8 will have a net different brain charts on the directions of the baryon different brain. Okay? It's clear? Okay, so having some configuration on the D8 brain that uh, gives a non-zero value for this uh, quantity is equivalent to having variance in the system. Uh, now, these guys are, uh, no? if you think about what kind of gauge field configuration is giving a non-zero value for this, that is an instanton kind of configuration, right? which is, uh, in this case, a type of soliton on the brain. Uh, so we find that uh, a soliton instanton on the D8 equals to a baryon. Uh, okay, so one can construct these instantons using the usual techniques. Okay. Um, typically, okay, you have to do some approximations, like maybe consider the instanton localized at the bottom of the D8 brain, so you can approximate the geometry by flat space, and then you can take the solution from flat space and neglect the curvature corrections. This works well because this, the size of this uh, instanton is actually very small, 
typically the size of this instant term goes like one over the square root of the top coupling. So now it's good for this approximation, but it's not so good in the sense that uh, this means that alpha prime corrections should be important for this, but typically they are neglected. Um, okay. So now in the VQCD model that I mentioned, it works similarly. One considers instant on configurations. Okay, and this tells us how to describe single variance. No? Now we want to describe a finite density, finite variant density. So that means that we will have to consider many of these uh, objects. This will be equal to some multi instanton configuration. So this is uh, very hard. I mean, there are works that uh, have uh, constructed some of these multi instanton solutions. But to have something which looks like a large baryon density, which is almost homogeneous, uh, well, I think it's out of the uh, capacity of uh, what people have done so far. I mean, there are interesting results that you can have some lattice structure of the variants, and so you can consider some crystal phases, and then you see that you start, as you increase the baryon charts, you start having them at the bottom of the geometry, and then they appear in different layers in the radial direction, so that's called the popcorn. But for these applications to neutron stars, people try to go around having to find these multi instant solutions. Okay, so what people do is they introduce some additional phenomenological approximations. And so for homogeneous, homogeneous. Sorry, this yeah. multi instanton is like the in flat space, the instanton of charge large, like that one you wrote over there. Yes, yeah, so close to the bottom where you can neglect the curvature, then it will just look like the instant of and, flat. And is that the ADHM solution? The BPST solution. Is, tell me again. BPST. Yeah, okay. The NF equals yeah, yeah. to. And then you can construct multiple instantons using. ADHM. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Right. All right. Yeah, okay. Um, so to consider how homogeneous variant density, people either consider uh, like point like instantons and point like instantons. Uh, or just uh, some kind of singular configuration for the gate sphere. So, so the first case you just uh, will take that this uh, quantity is something like a delta function that doesn't depend on the directions of the field theory. Okay. So it's just a delta function localized in the radial direction. Of course, this is not a solution to the equations of motion but you just plug this kind of thing in the action and you start to compute. Uh, and then the second case is that you write uh, your gauge potential
So this is for NF equals two. So this is a non-abelian SU2 uh, in the SU2 algebra. So these are the Pauli matrices. And then you have some function of the radial coordinate. Okay. Uh, well, in the case of the antipodal configuration, we can just, uh, there is this coordinate set that we introduce. And then the point here is that um, this object is a total derivative, right? Trace of f which f is a total derivative. So if you plug this, sol this configuration inside this uh, expression, and h is just a smooth function, then n is zero, okay? So you need to have a configuration where the boundary conditions at infinity uh, well, let's make it. You need that the value at infinity is different when you go to plus infinity or minus infinity. And that, that can only happen if the configuration is singular somewhere. Okay? Essentially, this is going to be going like one over set when set is going to zero. Uh, no, I think uh, that won't solve the equations. So this is a solution of the equations, but this uh, singular. It's a solution of the equations you get from the DBI axon for the gates field, but it has to be singular. Okay. So, well, you can think of this as having some kind of uh, kink on the D8 brain word volume. So uh, here maybe you have some uh, strings attached to this thing. OK. Uh, so OK, so these are the things people have used. And um, well, let's say with this kind of uh, approach, uh, you can compute the equation of a state for homogeneous nuclear matter and use either hybrid constructions, as I was explaining, or use it to describe all the matter inside the neutron star. So you can find realistic uh, uh, neutron stars using this approach. So, so there are realistic Neutron stars with uh, holographic matter. Okay, so they pass uh, these uh, constraints I ex explained about the from the astrophysical observations of the observations from gravitational waves. Uh, they don't necessarily match with the perturbative QCD part because uh, essentially this is in a different phase and you expect there is a first order phase transition to the quark matter phase. So this will, is this quark matter that should approach the perturbative result, okay? So, so the, there wouldn't be a matching to the perturbative part, but there could be a matching to the low energy part if you tune the parameters, okay? So, Okay, so yeah, so there are both for the Witten Sakai Sujimoto model and for the VQC model. One can construct these uh, neutron star configurations. Typically, the holographic matter appears for baryon densities which are around or above two nuclear saturation densities. Okay, so it's more or less reasonable. Now this is where you expect uh, 
that the theory is strongly coupled and don't know how to describe it. And people has compute other quantities like uh, transfer properties or, uh, well, introduce more realistic uh, features like making the system uh, uh, charge neutral and having beta equilibrium in the nuclear matter phase as well. So that means you also have an isospin chemical potential, not just varying chemical potential. No? So you have to have more neutrons than protons. So these things have been uh, considered as well. Okay. So just to wrap up, uh, no? it looks like one can use these holographic models and apply it to these systems. They give reasonable results, but there is a lot of work to be done, no? especially it looks like we need to have a good description of the nuclear matter phase in the holographic model, and we still don't know how to do this uh, properly. No? We either have uh, this uh, difficulty of trying to find uh, multi-instanton solutions, which is a very hard problem, or uh, this other issue that uh, if we want something homogeneous, which is simple, then we have to do these extra approximations or extra phenomenological input here, which give us something which is uh, not completely uh, well well defined from the point of view of uh, the original top-down model. No? So, yeah, that's it. Any questions? Yeah. Questions? So, um, in realistic uh, mo modeling of, uh, let's say, in uh, the astrophysics way of modeling neutron stars, one thing that I'm pretty sure of is that even within the regime where we expect matter to be nuclear, so not the confined quarks, uh, there are like some different shades of it in the sense that uh, one expects to be some exotic matter to appear at some points like hyperons or all this kind of heavy baryons. So my question would be, uh, at least in the framework of what is known in holography, uh, do you see any you know, pathway to incorporate this feature of uh, nuclear matter? Yeah, that will be, no. you, you can just have in the holographic model as many flavors as you would like. So you want to introduce these uh, hyperons, you just need to consider three flavors, right? And then, so you need several ingredients, no? First, you need to consider three flavors. Second, you need that uh, the masses of the quarks are different. So the flavor corresponding to the strange quarks should, be, should have a larger mass, so it starts uh, appearing later, okay? Uh, but there is no, in principle, there is no obstacle to in doing this for the holographic model. No? It's just, it complicates a little bit more things, but uh, it's uh, just a matter of <laughs> working. Yeah. More questions or comments? Okay, we thank Carlos for the very nice lectures. Thanks. Yeah, we'll be back in half an hour. But uh, so just a reminder, if you haven't put up your poster for the last poster session, please do so.